And Elizabeth actually was going to do something that actually had something to do with the fourth. She was going to read a biography of a founding father. And I thought, that's a great way to, <laughs> to commemorate the birth of our nation. And for the fourth, Pastor David posted on our Facebook page for um, our House of Purpose a verse that I want us to pray over our nation. I thought this would be a, a great Sunday to pray over our nation. And it's blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And there were a lot of people I saw, I don't know if you noticed it on like your social feed, but I noticed a lot of my friends uh, posting, maybe not this exact picture, but this verse. And so I just thought this would be a good time to pray this. You know, I just think you don't want to ever give up on the U.S. I feel like sometimes you can kind of feel like, boy, it just gets darker and darker all the time. And, you know, kind of thinking, okay, we're post-Christian at this point, and it's never coming back. That can be some of the thoughts that go through your mind. But you never know. You know, when I was a kid, uh, the USSR, the Soviet Union, existed. You know, and to us, when we were growing up, you thought that would never change. You know, you just thought that's how the world is. And no one would have ever thought that in 1989 the Berlin Wall would fall, you know, and that the Soviet Union would actually disband. You know, so I just think you never know. And God's people pray, and God tells us in 2 Chronicles 7.14 that if his people will humble themselves and pray, uh, God will hear from heaven and heal their land. So uh, let's pray this verse over our nation right now. So, Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to... First of all, just praise you and thank you, Lord, first of all, for the United States. Lord, I truly believe that this was a nation founded by you, Lord. It was a place where people who served you and loved you and followed you could come and have religious freedom here. And Lord, we pray that the United States would remain that way. We pray, Lord, that this nation would turn back to having you as their Lord. And so I pray, Lord, that you are helping us as a nation, Lord, and I do think really a lot of this can be just one-on-one -on -one relationships with people. That if we introduce people to Jesus, then you will be their God. And so I pray, Lord, that you are helping all of the churches all across our nation, Lord, that you would help them to be reaching out to the neighborhood around them, Lord. I pray, God, that people are coming to know you and that you would reveal your truth to them. Lord, we are praying uh, that you would be showing them their need of you, you know, Holy Spirit, your word says that you convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. I pray, Lord, that you are speaking to people's hearts. You're using your word to speak to their hearts. Lord, I pray that you'd help uh, just us as your church to be faithful in whatever it is that you might call us to say or do or to pray for people. Help us to be faithful to do those things, Lord. And so we just thank you for our nation turning around and coming back to having you as our Lord. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. And we would like to pray for you and your families as well. And so if you want to fill out one of those prayer request cards that's at your seat, uh, we would love to pray. Uh, we're not going to have our Wednesday prayer time this week, um, which I'll talk about in the announcements. But Pastor David and I will still pray over any requests that you fill out. And so you can fill those out and you can turn them in in the offering, which we will receive in just a few minutes. And also if you're feeling... The Lord prompting you to do an offering today. Now would be the time to prepare that. And so while you're doing that, I wanted to talk to you today about more of the incredible greatness of God's power. And today is the power to be transformed into Christ's image. I think that's an awesome power, isn't it? To be transformed into his image. And we've been talking a lot lately about kind of the power to see God, the power to have his, you know, Let's see, it's the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. That, we talked about that out of 2 Corinthians 4. That God is the one that shines that light in our hearts. And then he gives us that treasure. We talked last week about that. That is a treasure that he gives to us and that we get to have in these jars of clay um, in our earthly bodies. So that's an amazing thing. But today we're going to be still in 2 Corinthians, but it's 2 Corinthians 3.18. And it says, but we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. And so, kind of just starting with the very beginning there, it says, but we all, with unveiled face. 
Now, in verse 15, just a few verses prior to this, uh, Paul talked about that, you know, people who don't know the Lord, that when the law of Moses was read to them, it said that a veil covered their minds. They weren't able to really see the truth, which would explain a lot, wouldn't it, about even what happened to Jesus? Jesus came, he fulfilled all these prophecies, Moses talked about Jesus, um, and they just weren't able to see it. And they were like, we are disciples of Moses. We follow Moses. You know, and Jesus is like, Moses didn't do any of these things that you're doing. You know, what, what are you talking about? You're not really following Moses either. Um, you know, so they didn't see the truth about him. And it's because their eyes were veiled. But it says in verse 16 that that veil is taken away when someone turns to the Lord. And so it says, but we all with unveiled face. So we all have had our veil removed from our, from our minds. We are able to see the truth. And he says, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Which I think is kind of an interesting thing too. Because he's not talking about that you just see the glory of the Lord. But it's in the mirror. And what do you expect to see in a mirror? Like if you're looking in a mirror, what do you expect to see you, right? But he's saying that, no, you're going to actually have the glory of the Lord reflected back at you. Which I just think is an awesome thing to think about. That that is what's looking back at you in the mirror. That's what he wants. And it's because you're being transformed into his image from glory to glory. Just as from the Lord, the Spirit. So it is a supernatural change because it's done by the Lord, the Spirit. You know, it's not something that we can do in our earthly selves. You know, I think that's where people got off, really. You know, like even in uh, 2 Corinthians, Paul talks a lot about the difference between the law and the new covenant. You know, and the law was all about you following all of those rules and regulations, behavior. You somehow muster it up within yourself to, you know, do right, and, which utterly failed, right? You know, I feel like that was the, one of the main points of the Old Testament was God was just trying to show you can't do it. You cannot live up to my holy standard on your own. You've got to have help with that. And that's where the Spirit comes in, and that's where Jesus comes in. We have to have his help. And, you know, all the people out there kind of trying to give you stuff like self-help, which I feel like is really an oxymoron, isn't it? You know, I just feel like we really can't help ourselves. You know, there's a few people out there, maybe they have enough self-discipline to make some changes in their lives. They're the ones writing the books. And then all these other people buy the books and they're like, yeah, that sounds great. I just don't have the power to do it. <laughs> Where do I get the power to do it? And then I feel like because people started to realize, well, you never have any power to do anything, they started saying among themselves, well, maybe we should just stay as we are. Oh, yes, let's just stay as we are. Like, nothing's wrong with us. We can stay like this, stay in our dysfunction. And then we're going to really even celebrate it. And I'm going to call it my identity. You know, like whatever that sin is or whatever that kind of twistedness is that, that is just in each of us as natural human beings because of our sin nature. You know, which is just crazy as well to just be like, oh, well, I don't even want to be transformed into, into anything different. So I just think it's awesome that we get to be transformed into his image. And I wanted to show you another verse, actually. It's in Second, um, no, in 1 John 3, 2, because the Apostle John talked about this too. He said, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. And so there is kind of a future aspect of this, you know, because he tells us that it has not appeared as yet what we will be. So we will be able to be what God originally meant us to be. And we're kind of working towards that here in this life, but I feel like there's a, an aspect that we won't really hit until we are on the other side, until we're transformed. But when he comes, we will be like him because we'll really be able to see him as he is. Um, but there is an aspect of this that I think can be for this life as well. You know, and I think you just have to understand that we don't fully see him right now. It is actually in, in a mirror, right? The, um, in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, the Apostle Paul even said that we don't know fully yet. But he said that we see in a mirror darkly. Or, you know, or we see through the glass darkly, which is referring to mirrors. Because back in that day, mirrors were not like what we have. Actually, our mirrors are actually a pretty good representation for us, except for they're reversed. 
But back then, they were looking into like a piece of metal, trying to see their reflection. So you can really imagine that that would be sort of a dark image. And so we're just barely getting a glimpse of things to come. But I think the more we spend time with him and the more we are looking at him and beholding him, we will be changed to be in that image, which I think is an awesome promise for us. And that's really what people need to see, don't they? I just was thinking, you know, the world doesn't need to see me. You know, they need to see Jesus when they look at me. And so I want to be that awesome representation of him and be transformed into his image, which will happen as you spend time with him and not as you like use self-discipline to like force yourself into something. And so I just wanted to encourage you with that. Just keep spending your time with him. And I'm going to pray over that and then we're going to receive our offering here in just a moment. Well, dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for all that you do for us. We thank you that you made a way uh, for us to be your children, to have your nature. Lord, I just think that's an awesome thing, that, that you found a way to make it so that we are transformed into your image. And Lord, I pray that you just help each one of us just to spend that time with you, that quality time in your word, learning about you, having you speak to us, and then also in prayer. And I pray, Lord, that you would just continue to take us from glory to glory, Lord. And I just thank you for that. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And we're going to receive the offerings and the prayer requests here. Uh, Derek and Lonnie will do that. And so while they're doing that, I have just a few announcements here. First of all, just this week only, um, July 9th and 10th, we've canceled the midweek things because Pastor David and I are going on our vacation. Uh, this week and so uh, so next week everything will be running just fine actually Sunday also we will be here in fact that is the next slide here messenger next Sunday so I think that'll be good we always love having messenger in service so they'll be doing the worship for us and then we've got a movie coming up Tuesday July 16th so our first Tuesday back uh, we will be doing the movie the way home it's based on a true story and um, it just was a really good movie about kind of how a, a family and a town came together and everybody was praying and uh, God was working in this situation. And after that, I wanted to mention that we've got baptism on August 4th after the service. You know, so if you are interested in being baptized, that would be a, a wonderful thing. We would love to be a part of that for your life. So let us know. And with that, I'll call up Pastor David. Have you ever been waiting for something in your life for an incredibly long time, it seems like? And you're wondering, when, when is this ever going to take place? You know, I've been praying about this for years, and you know, I'm just waiting. You ever really seriously waited on something? You're wondering when it's going to happen, and what, when, when is it going to take place? And often we wonder, you know, with prayer, when is God going to answer? When is he going to respond? I've been praying and praying and praying. And we grow impatient, don't we? Because it's, it seems like it's taking a long time. In Psalm 94, we're learning about God's view of what time is like. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday, when it is past, and like a watch in the night. When I think about a watch in the night, I, you know, I spent time in the military and we used to do a, a thing called guard duty and we'd all come together and it'd be a, a certain unit's time to guard a certain aspect of the post and it would be like uh, an ammo dump or something like that uh, you'd be assigned to. And a watch in the night was typically about two hours. And you would think it was a long time to be out there. Uh, but if you're really observant, sometimes you'd see like these huge owls like overshadow you and fly across. And in the middle of the night, a lot of things happen and we're waiting. And, you know, it's dark. It seems like a dark time. And, and uh, those hours, that time that went by, it's, I remember it seems like such a short time, a watch in the night of watching over an area. People can grow impatient. 
And they, so they begin to devise their own solution. They begin to solve their own problem over time as if we could somehow help God with our situation. And so we think about, hey, how do I think this should work out? And we start to reason some things in our mind when we're waiting. It's interesting that God gave us an imagination, but sometimes our imagination can get the best of us. And sometimes people think they hear God when only they're growing impatient with their situation and there's a, something that they would like to hear. And so they say, well, I think God was telling me what to do because I see my situation. And you know, our situation, our circumstances don't dictate, you know, when God is going to answer. And Psalm 27 puts that into perspective in verse 14. It says, wait on upon the Lord. And you know what it says? It says, be of good courage. Be of good courage. What's the, op the opposite of courage? Well, if you put dis in the front of it, I feel like I'm dis and I'm discouraged, right? And so it says, he will strengthen your heart when you've done all you can do to stand, stand. And sometimes we have to stand in the promises of God, don't we? And he says, he will strengthen your heart. And he, he says it another way again. Wait, I say on the Lord. Wait on him. And you know what I've discovered over time? That the Lord's answers are always the best. And so what do we do when we're waiting? You say, well, do I just sit around and wait? Do I sit in, the, in a chair somewhere in my house? What, where, how do I wait? What do I do? You know, what, what helps me to be of good courage? After this first half of the psalm, the topic swings in Psalm 90. It swings to, from prayer, and it ends in a revealing statement. The key to living is to wait on the Lord. And so we're waiting on Him. We're waiting, right? But there's something that we need to be doing while we're waiting, while we wait for God's time to reveal His answer. God, please, I want your answer. And we want it like now. And we need to pray. One thing that we need to do is pray because He gives us peace, right? He says, cast your burdens upon me because I care about you. I care about your concerns. I care about your waiting time. I, I care about what you're going through. And so he wants to give us that peace during that time. And so we pray. And sometimes we forget to pray. You know, we tend to worry more than we do pray. And so, and somebody's impatient right now on the phone, but I'm going to turn that off. Sorry about that, guys. All right. I think that was my dad. He was, I'll, I'll wait on that call. But, you know, when the Apostle Peter wrote his second epistle to the churches in Asia Minor, he was in the depths of prison in Rome. And one thing that was a concern, and one thing that I, I've discovered too in waiting is you need to do something. So he's writing a letter to encourage someone. Maybe you want to think about writing a letter to encourage someone else and what they're going through. But one thing that we need to do is we need to pray. We need to praise. We need to continually say, you know what? I'm not going to let my joy go away while I wait. And to be encouraged, we need to serve. We need to be around each other. We need to serve in the church. We need to hear from someone else while we're serving that, man, you know, God does answer prayer. I waited a long time too, and you know, God did answer. Mm -hmm. And so Peter finds himself in prison, and he's writing this letter, and he says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 through 4, Know this first, that scoffers will come in the last days. This is going to happen. We, we see this in our day, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? We've been talking about the rapture quite a bit, haven't we, in the last few weeks. And they say, well, when is he coming? I don't believe that. I've waited so long and I no longer believe that. 
And they start doing their own thing and solving their own problems and walking according to whatever seems to make them happy. And so they chase happiness in every direction that they want to, but it never really makes them happy anyway. And so he says, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were since the beginning of creation. So there's a sense of time in that particular passage that Peter talks about as he's writing while he himself finds that he is in prison. And he says, look, I know it's bad out there. I know things are going to happen. We're living in a time where people reject God. We don't have as many people in church as we used to. But you know, we have faithful people. We have faithful people online. And I think about how uh, different people, uh, Junior Festo, that always uh, chimes in on the things and the, the videos and, and all kinds of stuff. And different people in different parts of the world chime in on the videos. So people are being encouraged while they wait. They hear a message while they wait. And when faced with his own unjust execution, Peter takes the time to strengthen the church. It doesn't look good to him right now. And he says, guess what? A lot of times it doesn't look particularly good in your life, okay? People are mocking you, making fun of your beliefs. And so the church, he wanted to strengthen the churches to be of good courage. And so he says, they needed to receive strength, they needed to receive courage in the Holy Spirit, just as he was in the place where he was at. And Peter always had been a type A personality when you think about it. I was watching The Chosen the other day, me and Nancy were watching that, and thinking about Peter, and uh, they had this scene with Matthew, you know, Matthew's a tax collector, and, and in that kind of series, he had wronged the fam, you know, wronged Peter, and, and almost cost him his reputation, his his money, his pursuit, and everything. And now, you know, Jesus has these people that are apostles and disciples that are directly opposite to each other. You know, and so Matthew comes up and talks to Jesus, and Jesus says, "You know, you need to really go uh, to Peter and ask for forgiveness." For what you did because he was a tax collector right he went to collect taxes and in that particular season Peter owed taxes he didn't know how it's going to come up with it you know he'd lose his boat he couldn't uh, and then then, and, uh, then how am I going to pay right so he he you know here he is Matthew and, and Matthew's walking along later and they're going to a place and, and Jesus looks and turns and looks back at Matthew like now might be a good time to do that. You know, now might be a good time to ask Peter's forgiveness. So he goes and asks Peter's forgiveness, and he's, he goes up to Peter, and, and uh, Peter goes, there's an, he, he, at the end of his statement, he says, there's an opportunity for you to forgive me and be blessed. Right? And Peter just looks at him, he's like, I'm still mad, and just walks off, and Matthew's just standing there. You know, the times that we go through things like that, we have to trust God. You know, we have to trust God that if we do the right thing, if we say, you know, we do what he's called us to do. And maybe there's somebody in your life right now, there's a time that you need to go to them and say, you know, Lord, how am I going to respond to this situation? How can I respond in this waiting time? And the Lord is saying, you know, there's something that you left undone. And you need to take care of it. And so somebody is dealing with that here in this room. And so God is, uh, you know, he's very patient though. And Peter's goal for this letter was to confront also false teachers. So we look at our lives and we say, man, we look around and I, I drive down 14th and I see all these false churches with all these kind of emblems and Man, that ain't kind of right. I can tell they're not teaching the right thing in there. It's more of a social club than a church. And so Peter's talking about the, the, the doctrine that needs to be corrected, the confusion that they had caused. And by that time, it had been almost 40 years since Jesus had left the earth, rose from the dead. And so Peter has been waiting too, 
Okay? So he's waiting 40 years, and he finds himself in prison, and he says, you know, there's going to be a time in your life where things are not going to make sense. You know, there's going to be some people that are going to talk completely against the gospel. They're going to talk, and he says, you know, they needed to be aware of these things while they're waiting. God has a view of time, but we need to gain his perspective of the time and the season that we're in so that we stay in courage. For 2 Peter 3, uh, 3 5 through 6 says, For this they willfully forget. You know, if a nation forgets where it came from, it won't know where it's going. We see that in our, in, in our world today. If we forget our mornings, if we forget our past, if we forget about what God has done in our lives in particular, well, then we lost our perspective of what He wanted to do during a certain time in our lives. And sometimes, you, you know, you may be in a place where you lost perspective on something that God had done and you need to remind yourself of who God is and what he's done and what he's taken you through in the past during that time that you're waiting for this they willfully that by the word of God the heavens of old the earth was standing out of water and in the water and by which the world then existed and perished being flooded with water it's like wow man this guy's encouraging me, but he's talking about Noah's flood during that time. He's talking about life, and but he's warning us as we wait. He's saying, look, I know you see this. I, I know that you see the destruction that people cause. I know, man, you look at the world today, and we think about Matthew 24, and we think about all the things that, that Jesus said was going to happen, and we can look at that and say, you know what? We're living in the last days. These things are being fulfilled. And so we see things changing in our world today. We can get discouraged or we can remain in courage. While we wait on God's timing, we need to build our lives on the Word of God. That's the rock. So that when the wind and the waves come of indecision, when the wind and the waves come and it says, you know, I've been praying for this for a long time and I haven't gotten an answer yet. That sometimes is that wind. That sometimes are those waves. That sometimes are the hard times of waiting. I feel like my emotions are getting tossed to and fro. So what do I need to do while I wait? I need to come to God's perspective of time and rest patiently in the ark, patiently in the word, patiently in the church, patiently in service, patiently in prayer, and regain God's perspective because his time is not like our time. And Peter continues in 2 Peter 3, through, uh, verse 7, But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire, for the day of judgment, and for the perdition of God, ungodly men. So what is this word perdition? We think about the Antichrist and you think about perdition. We've been talking about uh, the rapture and things like that. What exactly is perdition? Till the son of perdition appears. Perdition simply means this. It's the tragic consequences of violations and rejections and perversions of God's law. We see it in our world today. Perdition is a good word for that. Leading to the processes of destruction, human personality, the spiritual, physical termination of things that are sacred, things in, in life, Inevitably, to walking away from God, that's something that you don't want to do. You want to walk towards God when you're in a place, in a time in your life, not away from God. We see that, you know, in our world today, that people got separated by things like COVID and all those things. 
I remember I was on a phone call with Governor Polis and some other Christian leaders. They said, you know, they came around to me and a, another pastor, another leader asked, and said, Pastor David, what are you going to do about this COVID and the gathering together and, you know, all this sort of thing? I know you got a perspective. And I said, I don't know what the rest of you are going to do, but I'll tell you what we're going to do. I see people dying in the streets. I see people discouraged. I see people not you know, their lives are falling apart. They don't even know who they are anymore. I've seen people getting killed. Uh, you know, I'm hearing about tragic events and, and people dying in the alleys around us. And I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'll, we're opening our doors. And you know, the governor said, oh, I can't stop you. Really? It seemed like you wanted to. But you know, we got to decide where we're going to stand while we wait too. Amen? we got to decide on which side of time that we are going to stand on. Are we going to stand for God when the times get tough? Interesting thing. This is something that I came across when I was thinking of Peter and I was thinking about. He's telling us, man, there's, there's a lot of destruction going on. He's waiting while he's in prison and he's sharing. There's people teaching false things and all these things are going on. And he talked about Noah and he talked about the ark. And uh, when God created the earth, it's interesting. He, he seeded it with sufficient water for Noah's time. There was water above the earth. It was like the perfect environment, right? So there, it says that there was water above the expanse of the earth and there was water underneath. So it was like a whole nice, beautiful climate, perfect climate. Okay? Picture it. They were naked. They didn't need any clothes. Okay? So they're on the earth. Perfect climate. God seeded enough water, provided the perfect thing, the perfect environment. But when it came to people doing things their own way, later on, it became a point of destruction. The water came down. And the water exploded from the depths of the earth, and the, the water dropped. And our earth has never been the same since. Only God can bring it into right perspective. In the same manner, he seeded the heavens with enough fire to destroy them. In this nuclear age, we understand that matter is stored up energy. In, in an atom, there is enough stored up energy to create a bomb. Okay? By splitting the atomic nucleus, it results in a fiery release of enormous quantities of energy, huge amounts of energy. But here's the good news. You say, well, he's in prison. He's talking about all. Here, there's some good news ahead of us, right? Because Christ holds it all together is why. In this time, in this particular time, there is a time for souls to come into the kingdom of God. Because in Colossians 1, he holds all those things together. If you think about the atoms and things like that. He existed and is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the controlling, cohesive force of the universe. And he is a controlling, co cohesive force of your life. Amen. When it seems like everything wants to unravel, when it seems like, man, the world is on fire, it seems like my life seems like everything is exploding around me, and I'm waiting on God's answer. But in that waiting period, we need to focus on who he is and that his time is different than ours, that his perspective is different than ours, that he is in control, that he is holding things together. Even though I don't see it, Christ is holding it together. See, God's timing is merciful. 2 Peter 3, 8 says, But beloved, don't forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years, like one day, one thousand years, our country isn't even that old. Think about that. Our country isn't even that old. I was alive when they did the bicentennial. Some of us weren't even alive when the bicentennial happened. 
And I remember they had all the tall ships come in and all these masts and stuff. That's a whole other story. I'm going down a rabbit trail. But <laughs> anyway, God's timing is so merciful. And we need to say, you know what? Maybe I'm not supposed to get that answer yet. Simply out of your mercy. He's merciful. He's focused about his purpose for us. He hasn't left you. He says, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. When a person does not allow God's timing perspective into his life, we do rash things. We bring about our own destructive desires. We think we should fix it. You know, I'm waiting. I, I, I'm tired of waiting, so I'm just going to fix it. And you know what happens when we fix it? It becomes broken, right? If we're honest with ourselves, we can make a mess out of, out of all kinds of things. Because we are a lousy God unto ourselves. But God's timing is perfect. God, to God, a day is a th like a thousand years. Part of the life of faith is trusting God. That he's gathering all of the souls unto redemption during this time. And I need to be part of that plan. I need to say, God, how can you use me? What was unique is we got to pray. Uh, when I think about this, we're praying for a guy named David that got in a motorcycle accident. He's up at University Hospital. Me and Max got a chance to visit with him and pray briefly, and they were going to bring him out of the coma that day. But I thought about a time in the past when I went on my second date with my wife. This is our anniversary day today. And when uh, the second date that we went on, I told her, I'm not going to say where we're going, but we're going to go. And so we went up to a place, and my neighbor uh, verified this the other day, too, who lives next to me. She's a physician's assistant. She works down the street from Kindred Hospital. And Kindred Hospital is where they send you where you're going to die. They put you on a ven ventilator. You're in a, uh, in a coma state, okay? N nothing's happening. You're not moving. Okay, they're expecting you to die. Okay, time has ceased from where you're at. So we go up there, only family is supposed to get in. Okay, so we go up to this place, and walk in the front door, and I said, I don't know how we're going to get in. All I did was pray. I didn't even relay it to Nancy, and I said, we're going on this, this place. It was an unusual date, so I take her to a hospital, right? You ever, take, you ever go on a date to a hospital? That's kind of strange, but that's what God called us to do. So we go up to this place, go to the front door. Lady sitting at the desk, I said, I'm here to see um, Rich Carlson. He was a guy that was in, in our American Legion post. I go up there, I'm here to see Rich. She looks up at me, looks down, what's your name? I give her my name, she says, go ahead. So I go upstairs, not supposed to be in there, okay? Go upstairs, pray over this guy. He comes out of the coma, he actually sat up, didn't he, while we were in there praying? He sat up, and then the next day he was out of the hospital. Get this, he was in a suspended animation in life. Time had stopped, but God answered a prayer in that particular room. This guy comes out of the hospital. The next time we see him is the very next month in an American Legion meeting. We're in the American Legion meeting. He goes, I know that you're in my room. He receives Christ in that meeting. So we need to say, God, how can I focus on souls during this time? How can I get my focus off of me while I wait? How can I do that? I can pray, I can praise, I can serve. God, well, how do I need to pray? I need to enter into praise. You know, sometimes we gotta tell our face to praise, right? Because we don't feel like it. And I've got plenty of experiences in my life where I didn't feel like it. But I began to praise and God lifted, and lifted me up and gave me courage. And I wanna encourage you with that today. When you wait, you're waiting on the Lord. Amen? You're waiting on Him. You're serving Him. And God loves people. He cares about people. So why wait? 
It says in 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but he's long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. How can I be a part of that? While I wait, God, how might we try to imagine how much greater God's time is than ours? While we wait on our own answer, let's respond to his solution for people. Amen? Instead of our own, instead of solving our own problems, let's do what God has called us to do. And God will give us the courage to do it. In Revelation 1.1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things much take place, must shortly take place. Listen to the way he says that. These things must shortly take place. John, you're on the island of Patmos. They tried to boil you in oil, and here you are, you're exiled to the island of Patmos. It's like time has stopped. And God says shortly these things are going to happen. You know, what's happening in Revelation, a lot of what's in Revelation hasn't happened yet. It hadn't happened in, in, in John's day. And you know, Peter has this perspective when he's walking with Jesus. And Jesus asks him, three times, do you love me, Peter? After he denied him three times. And he asks him that to the point of frustration in Peter. And he says, Lord, I know... You know that I love you. You know everything. And he comes to that conclusion. And right after he gets done with that, he's talking to, uh, Jesus is telling him about how he's going to die. Okay, so he's in prison. He's faced with how he's going to die. He says, someday somebody's going to take you to a place where you don't want to go. And you know, they're going to stretch out your arms where, how you don't want them to be stretched. And what, Pete, what Peter says is he turns around and he points at John and he says, well, what about this guy? And Jesus says, what is it to you if he doesn't die and to the point of I, when I return? What is it to you? So Peter writes from that perspective. You know, he's come full circle according to time. He's got time to wait. He's waiting to die. And he says, look, life is tough. But, however, while you wait, we need to pray for a greater revelation of God's timing. We must acknowledge his love for us. And his timing is perfect. perfect. And we need to come to a place and repent and just say, God, your timing is perfect. I don't care what it looks like. Your timing is perfect. And we need to be thankful to him, no matter how long that answer would take. You know, I heard about a man named Martin tripped out, and it was in a speech by Ronald Reagan years ago at the 40th anniversary of D-Day. And this guy said, Martin Treptow, he left a barber shop in the United States, and, and this is in World War I, and he was carrying messages from battalion to battalion. He died during that time, but he wrote in his journal, he says, I will do what it takes. He says, I will do it joyfully. He says, I will work hard as if the whole conflict depended upon me. Think about that. As if this whole decision, this whole war depended upon me. While I wait, that's what I'll do. If it costs me my life, that's what I'll do. And that's where Peter is at. That's what I will do. My perspective has changed. My values have changed. While I wait, I will seek his perspective. I will seek his perspective of time. People grow impatient. We need to wait. We need to pray. 
We need to praise and we need to serve. Then our courage will take root in our lives. When we wait on God's timing, we need to build our lives on God's word. We need to stand on his promises. When the wind and the waves come, that is our rock that we stand upon. God's timing is merciful and is focused on his purpose always, though. When a person does not allow God's timing or perspective, he brings about destructive decisions. So why would I move forward in my own direction while I wait? However, I can move in God's direction. We need to pray for a greater revelation and acknowledge his love and his perfect timing. We need to be thankful to him no matter how long his answer may take, let's pray. Pray with me today. Say, Dear Lord, I repent of my impatience. I will wait. I will pray. I will serve you. I will seek your face in your word. Show me what to do, how to minister, while I wait, help me to stand courageous in this last time where it looks like the world is spinning out of control. Give me the wisdom and the courage for every moment, Lord, while I'm waiting. I want to be purposeful. I want to know what you want me to do. I want to stand. Not walk away. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to worship.